Well, you know, Blake said a wonderful thing. He said, if I can get it right, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So all you have to do exactly. is say it. Exactly. When can you say it simply enough? Is it only said in silence simply enough? Or are there words? Or is there music? Or is there what? Or is there... There's words, there's music, there's silence, there's gesture. Because yeah. it, it's always going to exceed one's grasp. See, my mantra is the Gandhi line, my life is my message. That, yes, and you that's said that the other night. That's level very good. good. Of every level of being. I'm standing in the center of one of Central Europe's most beautiful and mysterious cities. This is Prague, Czechoslovakia, and I'm Terence McKenna. We're here to meet with some of the world's most outstanding thinkers to discuss science, spirituality, and the mounting global crisis. And it's fitting that we should meet in this, the capital of ancient Bohemia, for Prague and Bohemia have always stood for intellectual innovation, chance-taking, and the life of ideas. In the Jugendstil splendor of one of Prague's most famous concert halls, we encountered Richard Alpert and persuaded him to have lunch with us. Alpert, who now calls himself Ram Das, is one of the most enduring figures from the American cultural upheaval of the 1960s. Alpert, whose career reaches from Harvard University to the plains of the Punjab, has transformed himself into a spokesman for humanities ignored and downtrodden. And Ralph Abraham was sitting across the table watching me have this it, conversation. Yeah. And when after it. Steiger left, Ralph leaned over to me and he said, so you see, Terence, the mushroom is telling you that it can reach out and touch you anywhere. And I thought that, yeah. that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any time you would like to or feel that you have the time to guide me through anything at all, I'd be happy to be your... Oh, okay. Oh, and uh, excuse me, sir. You, you are not the famous uh, Terence Mushroom McKenna. That is you, my uh, my friend. I, 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 it I, I is. am aware of. That's him. It That's is. Oh, how wonderful! It is. Yes, sir. Please do welcome uh, you on our Bohemian Highway. Here. I especially bring you a very good uh, black uh, coffee and uh, espresso. And uh, if you may tell me, who is the attractive elderly gentleman you brought on your side on your companionship here? This is Mr. Dawes. Oh, uh, the M. S. Dawes. Yes. No, the oh. Ram Das. Oh, the the CD Ram. Um, CD Ram, yes. CD the, Ram the, Das. The, the LSD, the LSD, LSD Das. LSD Das. Yes, the one. Oh, yes. Wonderful. Take this and build the beam. Oh, thank you. you. Thank Very you. Very Bohemian. And uh, <laughs> so uh, this. Uh, I am so happy to be in your fair country. Oh, my country, very fair and uh, happy to have the LSD experience. You know, you what is your YouTube's, name? What is your name? Uh, my name is Waiter. Waiter, waiter yes. how do you do, Waiter? waiter. Okay. A pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. See you, Waiter. Okay. <laughs> See you, Waiter. <laughs> you don't think there's any... It would, it would needs the external form of the mushroom. It would never have happened for me. I only argue from my own experience. Yeah, but you and I were both so thick in crap when it had, you know, that's why we needed it. Well, but there are a few others out there. We didn't corner the market on yeah. being thick in crap. Yeah, but I'm talking about somebody like a Ramana Maharshi or somebody like that. Oh, well, these people. You know, I mean, there are people. Sure, who, but the idea is not to come up with something that the best among us can make hay with, but a, a democratic, uh, something which addresses the species. The thing that seemed to me so important about the psychedelic experience was that it happened to me. I wasn't reading John Chrysostom or Meister Eckhart. Exactly. Of course those guys... Right on, it happened to me happened to me yes. yes and and so yes. I assume that I am a very ordinary person therefore if it happened to me it could happen to anyone and that's, that's really a question something. of all you know, there's a set of assumptions there one that you're a very ordinary person 
and whether the same chemical given to a dozen people would bring about 11 other people like this. And I think it would be not, it, it would, the outcome would be very different. And that's, it, I keep getting cast into an evolution of consciousness model about individuals because there's such marked individual differences as to three people come before my guru, one completely goes and the other two get a chapati. And people take psilocybin and they, some go like that and they go like that and some go like that. And they go like that. Well, don't you think a good metaphor for it would be sexuality? Apparently there are some people who can kind of take it or leave it and others of us uh, it rears its ugly head with great uh, presence. Yet everybody has to I come notice to as I get older, I move from one of these categories to the other. <laughs> it leaves so much space in my life. I don't know what to do with my free time. I hope it never happens to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> just clinging. <laughs> just clinging. No, just aspiring to cling. <laughs> Actually, I live the life of an ascetic. It's my aspirations that are pulling me down. Uh, well, see, the great, the nice thing about this evolutionary argument is that you can sort of make the snake take its tail in its mouth exactly. because exactly. it does. The escape is not into some science fiction future. No, it's into an archaic recursion of some sort. We we once knew everything we need to know yeah. so what we are trying to find out is lost knowledge not new knowledge and if you direct people back toward 10,000 20,000 years ago they see a kind of completion that an open-ended future is uh, it seems to me it's a con it's a confusing thing to use time in that way because it makes the artifacts of that period seem to be valued as opposed to the artifacts of this period. It seems to me that I, I mean, whether you, you call it not science fiction, but science fiction can also be very compassionate. It can be very historically relevant. It doesn't have to be, uh, it's just using a different set of artifacts to work with, so. Well, for instance, I see most of what's happened in the 20th century as being unconsciously driven by this fascination with the archaic. Fascination with the archaic? Yes, I mean... Wow, that was... Uh, of all the things I predicted you'd say, it wasn't that. Tell me... What well, uh, for instance, uh, Impressionism deconstructs the hard image of realism and gives you a feeling toned thing, which mm -hmm. was very antithetical to Victorian Edwardian thought. Then Freud and Jung describe different aspects of the unconscious, but to do it, Jung ha uh, Freud has to talk about uh, repressed, primitive, sexual imaginings. Jung talks about folklore, fairy tales, and mythology. Meanwhile, the Dadaists and the Surrealists are saying we have to break up the linear expectations of the bourgeois mind. And then you get it, Jackson Pollock and mm -hmm. those people who say the image itself has to be thrown out. And then, to my mind, the psychedelic thing in the 60s, based on rock and roll and a boundary dissolving psychedelic, we almost by a random walk are finding our way toward shamanism, tribalism, nomadism. Uh, go beyond the isms to find out, tell me what we're really finding. We're finding a world made out of mind rather than stuff. Right, okay, we're finding a world made out of mind. Every time you describe which mind you find, that's just limiting, a limiting condition. I mean, if we just find the, the thing of mind-created stuff, live in that, then what happens? Well, I mean, there is a transcendental dimension beyond language. It's just hard as hell to talk about it. But if you live in it, and talk from there, then the forms that it will manifest in become just the forms it manifests in. It's nothing more or less than that. So, so you mean you download the unspeakable down, you, into language yeah, and let the chips it, fall where they may? Well, they don't fall where they may. They fall in a perfectly harmonious pattern. 
Well, that's them falling where they may. Where they may, where yeah. they will. Yeah. 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 Well, so what I'm hearing from you is you have a very strong sense of the pattern, strong enough that your limited, necessarily limited personal viewpoint doesn't tend to get in the way. You can always push the reset to hope button, and then you hope, almost on principle. Trump has said to me, stand halfway between hope and hopelessness. I thought that was very useful. And is that, eh? No. <laughs> what is it? It's ah. It's, it's, okay. it's the ecstasy <laughs> of total horror and total beauty at the same moment. That's what I feel again and again. It's when I'm with somebody dying of AIDS. My God, my, my heart's breaking. It's horrible. I mean, it's a ghastly thing. The social ostracization, this, that, opportunistic illness and everything. And there's another part of me that's giggling. And I can hardly handle the, the, the multifrenia of it all, in the sense of the, the perfection of it all, and the beauty of the moment, and the horrible shit of it. You know? Well, it all is spun together. Is that because you feel confident that the self is somehow indestructible, or because you don't even ask that question? You gotta watch the words indestructible because that has a time dimension. I mean, I think the, that awareness is uh, that. Uh, but for example, I, do you think this is the stage upon which all acts are performed, or that we move no, up this is and one down of the stages, many levels? Oh, infinite number of, probably infinite number, because I just look into two minds and I see two different ones. And those are all on just this one. No, I feel like, like I have this friend Emmanuel, you know, this spook that has no body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Emmanuel's two lines to me were, death is absolutely safe, first thing. That's a very profound statement. And the next thing he said, it was like taking out the tight shoe. And then I said to him, Emmanuel, what am I doing here? Who made this error? What am I doing on this plane? He said, you're in school, why don't you try taking the curriculum? And the curriculum is? Life. Any life? It means, it means the exploration of the clinging of mind within the world of projected form. So the exploring life. It's the exploring life with the, pur it's purposive in the sense of returning back into the Garden of Eden. It's a return. There is a return metaphor underlying all of it. And I'm sure you're asked this all the time, so am I. Uh, maybe we give different answers. Do you think that this can be done without psychedelics fast enough to have an impact on the global situation? Uh, I can conceive that it could be. Uh, you, you asked, do I think? I don't really have an opinion whether it will or won't, but I, I could see it go either way. Well, I mean, I, like John Seed said to me, it's too late as far as the rainforest is concerned. He says the inertia is too great in the whole system. It's too late. So I said, okay, John. I mean, it was the first time somebody said it to me just like that. He said, it would take a miracle. I said, oh. That threw me back on whatever that was. And then he said, but after all, he said, we came up out of the ocean, came onto land. He said, we have quite a lineage of miracles. I wouldn't underestimate it. That was a nice one. Well, so my question to you is, are psychedelics a miracle? Psychedelics are a miracle, yes. They may not be the only miracle. Are, are they the they, miracle we need? I don't know that. I don't know that. I think they may have already done what they were to do. Really? That's yeah. interesting. I think it's never heard anything. I think say. what is done is so much more powerful than anybody yet recognizes. See, I see that the, all this destruction is just the process of transformation. The question is whether we'll keep it together in the process of transformation. And that's why all I'm interested in doing is becoming a person and helping others become a person who, in the process of the dramatic stuff, will keep some equanimity and keep.
keep there's some love and some presence in that process. But that's psychedelics may play a role in that. Mm -hmm. So you're right, that comes back to your question. Your well, see, my assumption in trying to think about thousands of psychedelic trips rather than just mine, what they seem to do generically is they seem to dissolve boundaries. Yes. And the ego yes. is in the business of creating, maintaining, and defending boundaries. So I really see the psychedelics as directly intervening in the core process which is running us over the edge, which is our inability to emotionally connect with the consequences of what we're doing. If for a single yeah. moment we could yeah. feel what we're doing, yeah. we would stop. I understand. But we do it's not. It's interesting because you take images that all, all of us know um, of the um, a girl running down the street naked in, uh, in uh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. And we say that wasn't strong enough. It all, you know, it won the Life of the Year award, but it wasn't strong enough. It didn't stop everybody and say, holy shit, what are we doing here? You know? So what would be strong enough to do that? And you say, well, psychedelics, but that's in a, it's in a one-on-one -on -one thing. I mean, we're talking major game players at this moment. Mm -hmm. Take, I mean, put China into your computer. You know? How do you deal with you know, that? I mean, either you're spraying it or it's water or it's, it's some other level of consciousness that does it. There is a a certain level of trauma that's possible that can soften the ground. Right? Not Three Mile Island and not Chernobyl, but I mean, I'm, <laughs> I don't want to create this with my mind, but I can imagine a certain trauma like in Marin when they ran out of water mm -hmm. it was interesting suddenly all the ego barriers and everything and neighbors were talking who'd never even met each other people were taking and a showers whole pro together, yeah, exactly. a whole right? process was happening I'm sure marriages babies were conceived everything as a result of that trauma of that denial so a, a massive significant trauma I just got to tell you one scary image there's a saint in India who lived up to about uh, 1930 I think or something and one of his devotees said to me, one night he was sort of looking off in the distance, and he said, there'll come a time, he said, when you'll walk five miles, and he said, you'll sight the light from a fire of another person, and you'll be so happy to know another person exists. Quite a prediction. Isn't that quite a prediction? Yeah. It's in there. It's just in there somewhere. You know? Interesting. Yes, well, I, I agree. I think that, that what's going to happen is that... Gentlemen, everything is fine with the evolution of coffee and consciousness. <laughs> Both very good with you, too. You have yes. come just at the right time. Yes, this is just yes. what I want. How did you know? You have tuned into a higher level. A higher level. A higher level. level high, very high, yes. I eat Bohemian mushroom soup today. You know? Ah. Are you eating? We were just talking about that. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. You, you, you like Bohemian mushroom soup? I like mushroom. Let me sprinkle liberally some water on your chalice, sir. Oh, please. That is, uh, liberally sprinkle his chalice. Yes. For sure. Very good. I am and, a chalice, uh, so it's fine if you wish to. Oh, I know you be you, you by your true name. You're Mr. Yes. Chalice, sir. Yes. yes. Very good. You also some please. water in your... No, no, in, in, no. I, I was confused. <laughs> Let me put this here. And... Uh, have fun with the uh, shaman strudel, bohemian very good. Thank you very much. You call when things are getting dangerous. I'll okay. call you. I'll be right back. Not to worry. Good, good. <laughs> <clears throat> can I ask you a personal question? You can ask me anything you'd it's like, Terence. It's not a personal question to you, it's a personal question from me. How, how do you like having the projection of special identity constantly laid on you. It's a sadhana. It's my practice. That's a good answer. Although you didn't say how you liked it. I like it to the capacity I have to transpose it. If I can't, I mean, sometimes these are going very fast, and to just keep it transposed, then it, I love it. I love it. It's like a fire. If the minute I start to lose it, it's a fucking drag. It really is. Because, I mean, you know, I was in a system, situation in Miami where all these women 
with blue eyes and coiffured hair were grabbing at the buttons of my jacket. And I thought, oh, I don't want this. Whatever this life is, I don't want to be part of this. I mean, this is, they eat your flesh, finally. Sure. And, but I realize at any time, I can walk away from it. And it's my, you know, I'm, I'm a free agent. So do you never get in a situation where you say, gee, I'd like to do X, but Ram Dass would never do that? My uh, stock and trade, or my coinage, is in sharing just those predicaments publicly. See, I've turned it into, right? You've managed to, but public confession is the subtlest form of wastrelry. Of wastrelry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do it myself. <laughs> I'm not a good guy. Don't follow me. I'm a bad guy. Then I leave the stage and say, now I can really be a bad guy. <laughs> Come up and see my holy pictures. <laughs> That's the one of my lines in my lecture. <laughs> I don't, I'll tell you, you're all, I only see the, uh, the stuff that would disturb me is inside myself. It has nothing to do with out there. I out there is just being what it is, and I'm responding with my own stuff. And if my stuff is my enemy, it's going to get too much for me. And if it isn't, you know, it depends on how much I can consume it, joyfully participate in it, passionately, all of it. Well, you've sort of achieved a unique synthesis. I mean, you're almost a secular holy man, because I don't think people, I don't care much about what you believe or who you light candles to. Basically, I think I heard you describe yourself once as a kind man. And you've gotten incredible mm -hmm. mileage out of that because there are so few. It's far out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is... Well, when you talked about coming back into the boundarylessness, to me, that's the whole quality of compassion, has that boundarylessness to it. It's that your suffering is my suffering, and your joy is my suffering, and you are me, and here we are. And if and you, you hurt, feel I'm responding to your hurt, not because I'm a good guy and you're needful, just because here is... This is suffering, and this is the response to suffering. And we're both part of the same thing. And that's the way I like to play it from. That's, to me, it's like riding a wave. It's the joy of just being part of the force of compassion in the universe. Well, when, when you look, you mentioned in your talk the other night, since some people think the 90s are going to be a second turn of the spiral, I observed the 60s as a spear-carrying 14-year-old. I was down in the masses. What were the mistakes that are avoidable than if there's a second chance? And they're inevitably going to be avoided. The first mistake was idealism. The first mistake, and the mistake was thinking that because you had seen it, you could just go like that and everybody else would see it. And you could just say, it's all love, and then everybody would love. I mean, that was, it was a naivete. It was naivete. It was not working on ourselves deeply enough to be without the clinging of mind that made us try to use it. It's, it, was, it was our lurking righteousness that got in our way. Can you make a revolution, though, without an inner righteousness? That's exactly, that's the far out question of where would the action come from? And there's this line in Buddhism that says, out of emptiness arises compassion. And what I experience is that there is a way in which I can sit down in front of a truck or feed a person or go make love or go surf. And there is an appropriateness in every one of those acts. And for me to hear that, I've really got to shut up. And my, uh, my work is to keep shutting up, to hear which one it is. And if it is a revolution, it's a rev so be it. Mm -hmm. So be it. You know the story of the, of the monk and the uh, army general, you know, and the army general's disemboweling all the monks? Tell and me. his reputation has spread far and wide. He's a cruel, cruel man. And he comes into this village and he says to his adjutant, tell me what's happening. And the adjutant said, all the people are frightened, they're bowing down to you. All the monks in the monastery have fled to the hills but one monk. And the general was outraged about this one monk. And he gets up and he goes to the monastery and he pushes open the doors of the monastery. And he walks into the courtyard and there's the monk standing in the middle of the courtyard. 
and he walks up to him and he says, don't you know who I am? I could take my sword and run it through your belly without blinking an eye. And don't you know who I am? I could have your sword run through my belly without blinking an eye. That's great. That's the place from which revolutions can, can heal, rather than just starting the cycle all over again. Then this is the place we never found in the 60s. Mm -mm. I mean, I've always said no. we, it was no. all We well reduced and good. it to revolution, rather, and although we had the taste of evolution, we reduced it to revolution. Well, in the day they came with machine guns, we didn't stand like that monk. Everybody said, well, my God, you could get killed playing this game. And I flew to Laos and India for three years. But already we had produced the they by being so busy being we. Because so that they even noticed we, the fact that they noticed us was because we were busy being, we were busy making statements instead of just being it. So maybe, I mean, this is just occurring to me, that being in a place like Prague, the real thing we have to learn here is how to make velvet revolutions, non-confrontation. Exactly. exactly right, exactly right. That's why I admire Havel so much. That's why he's way up there in my... Because he's, 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 he is a compassionate leader. He's got wisdom, not just knowledge. He is tuned. There's a, there's a quality of his heart that feels present. And he said in this op-ed article, I just read his letter last month. Uh, I've I read it too. And, yeah. you know, he, at one point he said, uh, he said, we have to allow the naturalness to come back, the personal stuff, the heart stuff. I mean, he was right there with all of the... Do you see, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't, let me preface it by saying, do you see anybody who could play that role for the millions of kids in England and the United States who are now asking, where do we go from here? Is that good or bad? I guess the situation hasn't demanded the emergence of that being it. Of those kinds of Because it can't be anybody that comes forward and says, I'm it. Oh, no. It has no. to be someone who the people But the situation say, You're can it. demand the formation. I mean, you, you watch this. Do the, does the man make the time or the time make the man? You know, and you can feel how what took a certain person 20 years like to ride a bicycle, somebody later on can ride a bicycle like that because the whole culture rides bicycles. There's some like uh, process where it, the situation emerges where the person has to come forward and they're just forced out. I mean, I go and I look at all the senators that are running for this or that and I go to breakfast with them and I listen and I tune and Jerry Brown I hung out with and I said, you know, he's got interesting ideas, but as a, his heart, my God, he's got work to do. This poor guy, he's suffering so much. And, and I just keep, I love him, and I want those ideas out, but I want him to work on himself, you know? And uh, so but I don't do see you really else. care in terms of political terms whether Jerry Brown makes himself palatable to an electorate? I care because I work with the Mayan widows in Guatemala, and I feel like I'm representing them, and our, our government, our administration's policies are killing them and their children and their husbands and some way I've got to play my part as a member of a society that is imposing so much suffering on so many people. I can't just walk away and say, oh, I'm helping the nice Mayans. I've also got to realize I'm an American citizen that's hurting the Mayans and I've got to play both games to change one one way and to do the other thing. So <clears throat> there's a kind of, um, not to go egghead here, but a kind of coincidencia positorum, because on one level what you're saying is, it's all right, don't worry. And on another level, you clearly are involved in a search for defining your role, your where you would do some good. Optimum judo move. Optimum judo, judo move. move. So it isn't Awaken enough to just say the system. the system will take care of itself. But I am part of the system that is taking care of itself. So, so it's a sense I'm of standing acting without of acting through self. It's being not identified with the actor and not being identified with the fruits of the action. That's, I mean, to me, the, my, one of my basic texts is the Bhagavad Gita, and those are the two injunctions. Mm -hmm. And I really hear those. 
and they're very weird. How you do an act when you're not identified with being the actor and you're not attached to the group? I mean, I, I leave this, this funny, continuous paradox that suffering stinks and suffering's grace. And I live with both of those all the time. Well, I don't. I think most people do. Don't you I think? think most people have made a taken a position. Oh, that suffering is bad. They hate it. They want or, to keep you know, it away from. Or that from it's them. grace and it's, you know, lovely. Well, and then the great masses of people never really draw the distinction because no. for them suffering is like air and water. It's life. It, it's life. It comes with it's it. life. Burying yeah. the many children you bear. That's why I found in the villages in India less suffering than I found around the middle class in America. Certainly less whining. Well, less preoccupation with their with what they don't have. Well, they have a philosophy of reincarnation that must sustain them. There is something else that's feeding them. Where we have a philosophy of, you know, if you don't get it now, no, you never, never get will. It. <clears throat> exactly. We threw out in the councils of Nicaea, Trent, and Constantinople just the thing that would have healed, but we did it so that the church could have power over it. Well, I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche who said there was only one Christian and they crucified him. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> God, that's so oh. good. That's such a good line. <laughs> Here comes... <laughs> now, have you been uh, waiting for me? Because I'm the waiter, I need to wait. We've been looking everywhere for you, oh, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been waiting for the here and now, but that was somewhere else. Well, but can I uh, help you here a bit, sir? Uh, you can help us here, and you can help us now. There. Oh, very yes. good. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll help you here. I hope you enjoy my conversation. Yeah. No, I mean, you, do we get a check, talk? or is, is this all on the house? No, no, I am the check. I am the check. <laughs> this is Prague, my sir. God is everywhere, but Czechland is here, you know? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I keep one more bottle for you, you in please, the refrigerator. You <laughs> hold it and But not in the here and now. In the somewhere else, maybe later. But see you. <laughs> well, my, uh, you know, I was asking you what did we do wrong in the 60s. Yeah, okay. One thing that I has occurred to me, and I certainly felt it with my friends, was we assumed it would go on forever. We had no notion of window of opportunity. Yes. We just thought we'd yeah. blown the doors off yeah. uh, the hinges and they would yeah. never be put back on. Yeah. To me, the most amazing transformation in my lifetime is not the revolution of the 60s, but the counter-revolution of the 70s, where they managed to put the cuckoo clock back together again, even though we'd kicked it Did all over the... Did they or didn't they? That's what I'm... Uh, see, you keep thinking there was that opportunity in a close, and I think it happened then. And all of the 70s and 80s, and all that was this kind of reverberation to this process. And that I'm here, and you're here, and we're both still here since the 90s, and I got a lot of people that... Uh, you know, I talk now in middle America, and I look at my audiences, and they, they've never taken dope, they've never, they've never read a holy, Eastern holy books or anything. And I just say the same stuff I was saying in the 60s that I was saying to people with flowers and big pupils. And these people in the middle, you know, they're corseted, nice people. And they're going, and I think, far out, look, it happened. And I was looking the other way. Well, that's true. And that's where you're looking for the resonance of a person to come forth that speaks from that consciousness with the assurance of the truth of it. Right. You know? That's what I think. Why all this business of a Christ figure. I mean, I see why how seductive it is, but how we we're, we've gotten very cynical because we've projected into such a person a purpose. Instead of just that light forming out of the needs of the moment to create that light to which... Because I find if I speak from a true enough for a moment when I can do it, from a true enough place in my heart, it, it reduces the paranoia, the subtle veils of paranoia in another person. They, they don't, I don't do it to them, it just falls away. Because they test, they're testing, and they don't get from me anything that says like that. And I just watch them like a flower. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And that, and I think, boy, I give a lot to just be that instrument 
you know? That's worth working for. Well, that's for. a great role. That's worth it. But this is a role for every one of us. That's the role for, that's the role. That's what I said to the ITA. I said, you know, just don't talk about it. Exactly. Let's, let's do it. it. Let's be it. Do for it. God's sake. Well, you know, Blake said a wonderful thing. He said, if I can get it right, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So all you have to do exactly. is say it. Exactly. When can you say it simply enough? Is it only said in silence simply enough? Or are there words? Or is there music? Or is there what? Or is there... There's words, there's music, there's silence, there's gesture. Because yeah. it, it's always going to exceed one's grasp. See, my mantra is the Gandhi line, my life is my message. That, yes, you said that the other night. That's level very of good. Being, of every level of being. I think I'm at a little lower level because I'm very aware that um, I have to struggle to have my to say my life is my message. I would almost rather say my message is my message. Please don't look at my life because I'm a fallible human being and I'm constantly but fucking up. You see up. how that weakens your message. You see how that quality has means that the message doesn't come from the the root, the central, it, you're, it, there's a way in which it waffles. True. Because, and that's the thing, I, I really can't, once I saw the possibility of that, I said, why waffle? What is worth holding on to that's worth waffling about? Well, I once said to Leo Zeff, I'm sure you knew Leo, I said to him in a, in a meeting, uh, I said, Leo, you're, you're finished, you're completed, you're, you're baked. Me, I'm half-baked. <laughs> and I hope that the rest of my life will finish the baking you don't, process. You're not half-baked. That's what's interesting. I mean, when you and I talk, you and I hear each other perfectly. Truth. And so where are we hearing each other from? I mean, then we each play our game the way we play our game. You know, and you can play your game saying I'm half-baked. That's your strategy if you choose it. It's a mercurial <laughs> strategy. Yes, I understand <laughs> Here's to Mercurius. Hmm. You have somehow been able to survive the gauntlet of American media in a way that your colleagues and comrade in arms didn't seem to. They either had to step away from their leader role or they transmuted it into some lesser thing. So now Allen Ginsberg is poet laureate. Tim Leary is, uh, you know, keeps the club scene in it's Los Angeles in interesting. Yes. yes, but you, in a sense, never backed down, never retooled. You were also not first among equals back in the original thing. But when all is said and done, I was always the second. In a way, it's like birds. If you stay just behind the lead bird, you don't have to do much, you know? You're just kind of riding along on the... On the well, and Ralph yeah. tells me to be third is the real good <laughs> position. <laughs> it's like being the young prince. You won't ever be king. It was, actually, it was only until about five years ago. That I'd, in the past five years, they've stopped introducing me as Tim Leary's partner. Right. Know? And which, I mean, I think that was great. I see him as one of my, you know, first teachers, great teachers. Uh -huh. And, uh, but I don't have the fun for me. It says, I have no model of myself. I mean, I don't know who I am. I don't know whether I'm an anachronism from the 60s or I'm a just about to happen. A prophet to be. Yes, I have no idea. And I don't care. That's what I saw. Because either of them, all the things you get in either way are a drag and they're beautiful, equally. No, well, I think you're a prophet to be. I think we all are. The, you know, we all are. Yes. As Bilbo Baggins once said, the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I believe that. Yeah, I'll believe that too. when they lower my box. I I'll do believe too. That. I do too. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Well, thanks yeah. for coming by. I'm sure you had many, many demands on you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Pleasure. Good. I was afraid of you up until now. Now I'm delighted to no, be no, with you. No, no. Don't be afraid of me. The people who are afraid of me don't know me, or no. they know me better than I you know. ever will. <laughs> <laughs>